Hello, welcome back. We are moving on to stage three of cell signaling and cell communication. We are now on the signal transduction pathway. So let's kind of see where we are, uh, have been and where we're going on this particular picture. So remember growth factor, this was our step one. Receptor is our step two. And now we're doing signal transduction, which is like everything else in this picture. This is in the Doggy Rube Goldberg video that hopefully you have watched. Um, go back and watch it if you haven't done so. This is everything from the first little fling of the doorbell or tennis ball. I can't remember exactly what starts the whole thing. Um, all of those steps, the dominoes, the tennis balls, all that kind of stuff until we get to the very end, not the result yet, but from everything in between from the beginning to right before all the dominoes fall at the very end, that is your signal transduction. So it's just a whole bunch of messy steps in the middle. So again, just like I did for the other um, stages, I'm just going to walk you through a few examples of types of signal transduction. Now there's all different types. We're just giving you a few to kind of get your mind thinking about how cells can do uh, this this whole process of cell communication. So this is where we're at. This is gonna be part three is a signal transduction. Now let's see where that puts us in our kind of less chaotic looking diagram. So we are right here, right? So we are now inside the cell. We have The signal has been sent, that was step one. We have received the signal on receptor, that was step two. Now these receptors are gonna do stuff for us, for the cell to be able to do step four. So this is that intermediate. This is the intermediate um, kind of, or the, the, not quite the response, but the getting to the response. All these things that have to happen before the cell can actually do something. And some of these signal transduction pathways are really short and immediate. Some of them are a lot longer and more complex. All right, signal transduction, step three. This is one of those really complex ones. <laughs> So this is what's called a phosphorylation cascade. So in the last video, in the step two, I introduced the tyrosine kinase, which is what we see here. So here was our, this was our step two, right? This was step two, the receptor, the signaling molecule being sent, that was step one. Okay, so step one, the little red sesame seed got released from somewhere. Step two, it bound to the receptor. Just a quick review of the enzyme link receptor. It came together. It uses eight ATPs to phosphorylate all those tyrosines and activated this enzyme. This is our tyrosine kinase. Now I told you before, kinases are enzymes that add phosphate groups. And phosphate groups tend to turn things on. It's like an on switch. So when you add a phosphate group, it excites that particular molecule. When you take a phosphate group away, it breaks that apart. Now I have another name. Oh my gosh, I just lost it. <laughs> it might come back to me. I'm gonna say dephosphorylate, but that doesn't um, sound right. It might come to me. Anyway, there's another enzyme that's going to remove phosphate groups, dephosphorylate. That might be right. Um, and so that's going to be an enzyme that can remove the phosphate group, which will deactivate whatever the phosphate group was hooked onto. So let's take a look at this cascade. It's almost like the domino effect. So here you have your enzyme linked receptors been activated. We've got the signaling molecule binding. We have the coming together of the dimer. We've activated our tyrosine kinase enzyme. And so now we start with this guy right here, this gray inactive protein, right? It is a kinase itself. So a kinase is going to phosphorylate a kinase. And so inactive protein kinase one, this is the very beginning. This would be like our first domino. And when it gets activated by the tyrosine kinase of the receptor, it now becomes an active kinase. Okay. So I'm going to put a circle around the active kinase and its substrate, right? So the Thing that the enzyme is going to work on is another inactive kinase. So this is the blue one. Now active kinase one has a substrate for inactive kinase two. Hopefully I'm not going to get you lost here. 
So the gray blob, once it's activated, is going to activate the blue blob with a phosphate group. So here's our new active kinase. And if you'll notice, every single time we are burning a molecule of ATP, right? ATP is the high energy battery. It's full of energy. It breaks that off, and they're adding that phosphate and the energy onto this new molecule, which is our kinase. Right? So, so far we've activated kinase 1, active kinase 1 activates kinase 2, active kinase 2, you've guessed it, activate, oops, I was going to do my green, kind of keep a pattern here. So here is our inactive kinase 3, do, 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 which is going to turn into active kinase 3 from the activity of kinase 2. So this is the cascade part. So we activate the first one, which activates the second one, which activates the third one, which will activate something else downstream. Now, if you take a look at this one, its name is just inactive protein. It doesn't necessarily have to be a kinase every single time. The kinase is just are part of this cascade. Then when we activate this, this is now our goal. This is our active protein. So this protein could be an enzyme of something else. It might not have to be a kinase. Maybe it's an enzyme that's going to trigger the process of mitosis, or it might be uh, an enzyme that is going to open another ion channel, or it could be um, another protein that's going to trigger something else inside of the cell. But that's going to lead us to our step four, which we haven't done yet. Um, that's what this leads to. So here we have our step one was our sending of the signal. Step two was the receiving of the signal activating the tyrosine kinase. Step three, all of this stuff, let me get the red here, all of this is step three. This is a signal transduction. It is a specific type of signal transduction called a phosphorylation cascade because it's phosphorylate, 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 phosphorylate until you reach the end of the line, which is you're phosphorylating your final protein, which is then going to do something in the cell which we'll talk about in the last video in the step four, okay? So these are your kinase, uh, a phosphorylation cascade with kinases that are activated by other kinases. Now, what if we wanted to turn this off? Like we don't wanna just keep the sucker going all the time because that might cause some problems inside of the cell. So how do you think we would turn this whole shebang off? Well, how did we start it? We received the signaling molecule, so, cells have a way to turn things off is by removing the signaling molecule. So when the signaling molecule goes away, there will be enzymes that will come in and cleave all of those phosphate groups off that will inactivate the tyrosine kinase, and we would no longer be producing this enzyme, which would no longer, it just will follow the line. You are no longer activating those kinases. If you have inactive kinases, they're not gonna phosphorylate stuff and you'll go back to an inactive state. Now, I know I just drew all over this picture. Um, so that's kind of the idea, how you turn it on and we have mechanisms of turning them off as well. All right, so that's one type of um, signal transduction of this particular uh, phosphorylation, phosphorylation cascade or sometimes it's called a kinase. All right, so this next one is probably one of our easiest of the transduction pathways because it really is just steps one, two, and three, and four, for all that matter, um, are really just all tied together into one really rapidly um, occurring event. So let's say I'm going to kind of draw it up here so I can draw the steps. Actually, I'll do that differently. So let's say we have a plasma membrane, and in it, there, it's green here. So in it, we have an ion channel, okay? and that ion channel is closed, but it has, it has a receptor site. I forgot to draw my receptor site, so I'll do that here. Okay. So when there's no ligand in the binding site of the receptor, the channels close. Sodiums. Oh, sodiums are green in this picture, so I'll pick the darker green. So I'm going to have a whole bunch of sodium ions outside of the cell. So this is in the synapse. It's just showing the synapse, but it, could, it doesn't have to be in the synapse. So we know that there's a whole lot of sodium. So these little green circles equal sodium ions. So we know there's a gradient. There's a whole bunch of sodium outside, not very much inside, 
but because it's a charged ion, it's not going to be able to directly move through the phospholipid bilayer. We need a channel to be open. Now, in this case, the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, again, it's the same example. That is our step one, sending the signal. Step two is signal reception. Step three that we're at right now, this is going to be transduction. So the transduction in this case is the channel opening and the sodium ions flowing down their concentration gradient going into the cell. That's it. <laughs> it seems like it's too simple to actually be the case. That's all it is though. So we have a signal being sent. That was a, the acetylcholine being released from the presynaptic neuron. We have the reception, which is the acetylcholine binding to this ion channel linked receptor. And we have the transduction is just opening of the gate. This is called an open closed channel. So the opening of the gate is the transduction to allow the sodium to come in. The result that we'll see is altering membrane permeability, which can activate the cell. So we're gonna see that in step four, try not to jump ahead. But because it's all so like combined, you know, like four in one type of thing. So you have your receptor, you have your the signaling binds to the receptor, you have the opening of the channel, you have the ions moving in. That's basically the whole process of ion channel linked receptors. So that's a really easy um, transduction pathway. It's just one step, basically opening the channel, ions flowing in. Okay. So we just, again, have the specific example. Um, we actually have some calcium channels here. So it will work for lots of ions. It doesn't always have to be sodium. But then here specifically are the sodium ones that would work with acetylcholine. You'd have to have some other signaling molecule to open up those calcium channels. And you'll learn that in a &P when you take 231 if that is your path. Okay, so those are open closed channels. So we had um, phosphorylation cascade is one type of transduction. Open closed channels is another type of. All right, so here is our next example of a transduction pathway. This one's going to be associated with a G protein receptor. So uh, back in video two, we described the structure of a G protein linked receptor. And if you remember, it had the three parts. We had the radiator, we had the G protein and the boomerang, and we had the enzyme, right? We just named those pieces. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that one step further and see what does an activated G protein receptor do, that was step two, to trigger the transduction pathway, which is gonna be our step three, All right? So those are just the parts. So as I'm walking through this, it's just gonna be kind of a review of what you just did in video two. So here we have the binding, of the receptor to the ligand. So this is gonna turn everything on. So we have that binding. What that triggers is a physical change, a conformational change in that receptor. And if you'll notice, it's gonna, these guys are gonna move over here, right? They're cuddling over there. The inside of the G protein receptor uh, with the G protein circles. The boomerang is going to get activated by the GTP and it's kind of squish its way over and bind to this associated enzyme. And now the enzyme is activated. That's the whole goal of a G protein linked receptor is to activate that neighboring enzyme because then the enzyme is gonna be able to do stuff in the cell that's gonna trigger this transduction pathway. So everything that I just went through is a review of G protein linked receptors. Ligand binds, G protein splits, the circles stay with the G protein, the boomerang part gets activated with a GTP, which then goes and activates its neighboring associated enzyme. In this particular one, the enzyme is called adenylyl cyclase. And so let's take a look at what it actually does um, once that adenylyl cyclase is active. Well, if we take a look at kind of follow these arrows, we can see a molecule of ATP, which is the bright, you know, our charged battery is broken down into a smaller molecule called cyclic AMP, or you might call it CAMP if you want to. It's a lowercase c AMP. That's adenosine monophosphate. So it's, we cleave off two phosphate groups. We're left with one phosphate group on the adenosine molecule, and it's been hooked into a ring form. On the next slide, I'll show you what that looks like actually. Um, so adenylyl cyclase converts ATP into cyclic AMP, which can then activate a protein kinase, which will then phosphorylate a protein, which will then alter some cellular process. That's the transduction pathway. 
So the receptor leads to the activation of this enzyme, which will then lead to cyclic AMP, which activates enzymes, which activates enzymes, which activates enzymes, which could lead to some kind of cellular response. That's your transduction pathway. I'm gonna post a video of um, this process with the binding of insulin or epinephrine. One of the two, I can't remember what the ligand is, but it's gonna be binding to a G protein um, on a liver cell, and it's gonna walk you through the process of the activation of the G protein link receptor and the transduction pathway of the result of in, uh, increasing the release of glucose uh, into the bloodstream, um, which would be the result, changing the alter, altering the cell process, which would be increasing the release of glucose. So make sure you watch that video, I'll link it in the helpful links, um, and it goes along with this particular slide. So let's take a look at what CMP actually is. So here is our ATP. So that should look somewhat familiar to you already. It's uh, adenosine, a sugar, and three phosphates. And when we usually, we break off that third phosphate and give us ADP. But if you take a look, adenylocyclase removes two of the phosphates. And here's the ring part, right? So we've got the sugar, carbon, oxygen, phosphate group back to the sugar. So that's our cyclic AMP. Okay, um, and then there's another enzyme involved. So this is our adenylocyclase. This is the one that's part of that G protein link receptor. And then if you wanted to break that cyclic part, there's another enzyme called phosphodiesterase, um, which will just break the ring and turn it back into just a regular old AMP, which could then go back into metabolic pathways and become an ADP and an ATP, and it can be recycled. So we have enzymes to make cyclic AMP, and we have enzymes to remove cyclic AMP out of the cell's cytoplasm. So you might be saying, well, why make cyclic AMP? What's the big deal? Can't we just use ATP or ADP? Well, not necessarily. We have an, uh, a new messenger molecule inside of the cell. So that's why cyclic AMP is sometimes called a second messenger, where the hormone or the neurotransmitter or the paracrine factor is the first messenger coming in and binding to the surface of the cell. And that's going to trigger the production of a second messenger, in this case, cyclic AMP, which then has special roles with, within the cell. So in this kind of colorful example, we might have an inactive kinase, right? It's turned off because it's not bound to cyclic AMP. Here's your regulatory subunits, and here's the actual enzymatic subunits. With the binding of cyclic AMP to that regulatory subunit, because adenylocyclase is making a whole bunch of cyclic AMP, this is going to activate your inactive enzymes, and now these guys can go off and do stuff. They can do stuff, whatever that stuff is in the cell. We're not going into in depth into all of the things that can happen, because there's so many, but I want you to be comfortable explaining this, this process of how cells can use these chemicals to trigger things inside of the cells. And if we can just call them do stuff or changing things, when we have names for examples, we'll use those. But if you're if you're lost for words, they, the chemicals do stuff and they change things, maybe, right? We'll see. Um, okay, so that is our um, second messenger with cyclic AMP. I have another example of a G protein link receptor with a different type of second messenger. This is just another example, right? It is not, um, hold on. Sorry, I had to take care of a text. <laughs> Um, all right, so G protein receptor, so it's the same type of pathway, but it's a different second messenger. So in this case, there's actually quite a few. This is a pretty complicated um, G protein linked second messenger pathway. So I'll just run through it real quick. It's just another example. I'm not expecting you to memorize this or learn this or um, really dig too deep into it. I just wanted to show you some variability between the cyclic AMP second messenger pathway and this phospholipase second messenger pathway. So we can see our binding, right? So step one, our signaling, signal was sent is step one. Step two, signal is binding. Here's our activation of the receptor with our cuddling of the circles to the, G pro, um, to the receptor. Our activated boomerang is coming and turning on our associated enzyme. In this case, instead of an enzyme of adenylcyclase, which we saw with the cyclic AMP, we have a new enzyme called phospholipase C. Now, phospholipase C is going to act upon some neighboring molecules. This is step three. 
it takes this PIP2, which I love all these chemical names, whoever came up with these. It takes the PIP2 and splits it into a DAG molecule and an IP3. We can get, we can get lost. Um, and what the DAG does is the DAG is acting like a second messenger that turns on another kinase, which activates another kinase, which alters cell activity. So this is one transduction pathway that happens with the activated phospholipase C. That's one branch because the PIP2 got split into DAG goes and does this. The IP3 goes and binds to your endoplasmic reticulum. Hey, bring it back some of our cell biology stuff. So the smoothie R, because that's more of the storage of ions, the IP3 goes in, binds to calcium channels and allows calcium to flow out of the smooth uh, ER. And the calcium in this case is the second messenger. Calcium acts as second messengers. So by this one receptor, this one G protein link receptor and this phosph activating the phospholipase C, we actually trigger two diverging transduction pathways with one signaling molecule. That's amazing. So we can have two different things happening with one signal within that cell. So just another example of a second messenger transduction pathway. Our first example was cyclic EMP. The second example is this PIP2 splitting into the DAG and the IP3. We can have a phosphorylation pathway or we can have a calcium ion pathway. All right, so that was our um, transduction pathways. We had the cascade, the phosphorylation cascade. We had the ion channel um, or the open closed channels and we have our second messengers. So those uh, transduction pathways all dealt with those uh, surface receptors with the ligands that cannot move through the phospholipid bilayer. But here we have, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the transduction, if you will, of those intracellular receptors. So I've got a two, two pictures. One's a little bit more um, artistic than the other. So I'll start, start with the smaller one first. So this box is representing the plasma membrane. This is a steroid hormone because steroids are lipid-based. Because they're lipid-based, they can diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer. Here is your receptor, is the blue guy. It's hanging out in the cytoplasm, sometimes in the nucleus. Um, so the steroid hormone diffuses through the plasma membrane, binds to the receptor. This is called a receptor hormone receptor complex, in this case, because it was a hormone. And those two things together move into the nucleus if they're not already there. And then it sets upon the DNA and regulates gene expression, right? We just got done talking about that in chapter 13 with um, gene expression, transcription, and translation. So this is where that um, fits in. A little bit more detailed picture on this cell is we have our triangle molecules. This is gonna be a lipid soluble molecule. A lot of steroid hormones are like that. So think of testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. They diffuse through the plasma membrane. In this case, the receptor is already in the nucleus. It binds to the receptor, which in this case is already loaded onto the DNA like a transcription factor. We talked about those back in chapter 13. So once you have the hormone coming in or the signaling molecule binding to the receptor slash activation factor, it's gonna trigger transcription, which will produce some mRNA. The mRNA will be translated, your protein, uh, product is going to be altering the cell's activity. And that's our step four, which we hadn't got to yet. So this would be our step one. This would be our step two. This whole process of transcription and translation is the transduction pathway, which would be step four. Cell activities, or sorry, three, cell activity altered is step four. All right. So that is intracellular receptor transduction pathways. I have one more slide to, before we wrap up. Um, just a little blurb in your textbook in this chapter uh, presents these things called scaffolding proteins, which are pretty cool. So scaffolding proteins, if you remember in the phosphorylation cascade, we had like the kinase, right? And we had this, activated this, activated this, activated this, until we got kind of like the end result. Now, if those inactivated proteins on this side are just floating around randomly in the cytoplasm, it's gonna be really hard to have them bump into their substrate. So 
scaffolding proteins can actually hold those intermediate um, inactive forms right next to each other. And so then you get a much e more efficient cascade. So if this was our active uh, enzyme, right, the tyrosine kinase, and it will phosphorylate this kinase, which will phosphorylate this kinase, which will phosphorylate this kinase, and they're all right next to each other because a scaffolding protein holds those substrates right next to each other. And so that increases the efficiency of um, this cascade. And so that's all scaffolding proteins are. It's a physical way to hold each of those intermediates in a close proximity so the reaction happens quicker. All right, so that wraps up our trans step three, our transduction pathways. And our last video will be cellular response. What are the things that the cells can do um, once all of the signal has been transduced, transduced into the cell? All right, I will see you then.